Thank you to Mickey and Doyle. Thank you to the co-hosts. Thank you to all of you for being here. So I usually start this conversation off by announcing something that may not be evident. My name is Stacey Abrams and I am not the governor of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> there are some who so I am not the governor, but that does not absolve me of my responsibilities. In the 10 days between election day and my non-concession day, as I, <laughs> I spent time thinking about what would I do if I didn't become governor, what work could I still do? And during the, the two years I was running for governor, during the 11 years I was in the legislature, during my 46 years on this earth, I have become very committed to this notion of democracy. I believe that democracy can and does work, but I believe it takes work. And what I saw in our campaign before that terrible end was that when you talk to people as though they are valuable, when you meet them where they are and invite them to join you, when you put aside your preconceptions about who they want and what they want, people want the same things. And in that process, when I was asking them to vote, I never said, I need you to vote for me. My, my exhortation was, I need you to vote for you. I need you to vote for the values you believe in, for the policies you need. I said this when I was campaigning down in Albany, Georgia, which is majority black. I said this when I was vote, when I was campaigning up in North Georgia, near where they filmed Deliverance, which is majority white. I said that when I went to Muslim communities and Latino communities, to Korean communities, to the disabled community, when I marched in the gay pride parade as the first statewide candidate to ever do so. When I... <laughs> when I went and talked about gun safety at a gun show. <laughs> I did that too. <laughs> because the reality is no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter where you live, you want access to opportunity. You want economic security. You want health care when you need it. You want to know that yourself, your community, your family can make economic progress. You want a strong education and you simply want to be left to live the best life possible. Now what that life looks like is left to you, but the way you get there is why we exist as a democracy, because we made this collective bargain years ago that we would bind ourselves together. We would all invest in a system that if it works right, all of us benefit. That's why we have roads, that's why we put out fires, that's why we have public schools for now. <laughs> why we used to have libraries. <laughs> because we had this belief that when we knit ourselves together in this social contract, the grace of common bonds can beat out the ignominy and danger of individualism run amok. But what happened in 2018 in our election was a fracturing of that contract. Because the beginning of that social contract in democracy is the right to vote. It has been the hardest right in America to make real. Because from the very beginning of our nation, we told a lie. We said that we were democracy and then we proceeded to eliminate almost every group from participation. If you were African American, you were a slave and you were three-fifths human. If you were Native American, you didn't exist. If you were a woman, you should be silent. And if you were anyone else, we didn't know how you got here because we tried to close the doors behind us. But the beauty of our nation, the beauty of our system is that over time, each time we had an opportunity to be better, we picked that choice. Usually after a really big fight, but we made some progress. We have the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the 26th Amendment. Each of those were designed to say out loud, yeah, we were wrong, let's bring more people into the fold. With the 15th Amendment, black men were given the right to vote, let's not get confused. <laughs> With the 19th Amendment, white women were given the right to vote. 1924, we finally made Native American citizens so Native American men could vote, and Native American women. And finally, we did the Voting Rights Act of 1965 so everyone could vote. And in the, with, the 20th, I'm sorry, with the 26th Amendment, we decided young people could vote since they could die, they should be allowed to vote. That's who we are. 
But the problem has always been that every time we make that progress, we make the same fatal error. Our constitutional right to vote has always delegated to the states the administration of elections, which is like saying you have the right to drive, but someone else gets to plot the road, decide when you get the keys, and give you a sobriety test that is broken before you can get in the car. And so what has happened over and over again in our nation is that we've said to the states that have told us we're going to discriminate. We say, we don't want you to, but go ahead. Govern yourselves. Shockingly, it doesn't work. <laughs> we had this halcyon period between 1965 and 2013 with the Voting Rights Act where we made the most progress we've ever made. Because we said as a nation that delegation of power may not work out so well if there isn't oversight. I don't know of any other institution where you would give someone the keys to your store and leave and say, I hope you don't steal stuff before I get back. I'm going to be gone for 30 to 40 years. <laughs> but that's what happened. Before the Voting Rights Act, we kept giving these rights but never holding people accountable for them until the Voting Rights Act. And it worked. It worked so well that people of color got elected to office, that coalitions of people of color and whites built community together, voted together, changed things together, and it was so effective, in 2008 we elected this black guy as president. And then all hell broke loose. Because when Barack Obama became president in 2008 and won not only Florida, but Indiana, people got really concerned. Because the right to vote was real and the nation was changing and they were terrified of that combination. And so starting in 2009, they started to draw back the powers that have been allocated. They started to prepare for war, not on any community, but a war on democracy. Because they realized that they could either change their narrative or gain the system. They could either expand their tent or they could lock people out of the process. And over and over again around this country, they chose the latter and we've seen the consequences. We saw a takeover of state legislatures in 2010 and 2011 that happened because we were all still celebrating 2008. While we were reveling and marveling in what could be done, they were plotting to take it back. And they did such an extraordinary job that we have lived 10 years in the shadow of their choices. What they did in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, what they did in Georgia and Florida and Arizona, what was done in the name of the people across this country was a theft of democracy. But the problem is there are more of us than there are of them. Yeah. And in 2018, I decided to test that theory. You see, I ran a campaign in the blood red state of Georgia, or so I was told where number one, a black woman should not run for office. And given that no one had ever made it as far, there had never been a black woman candidate for governor for a major party in the history of the country, the pundits seemed to have a point. <laughs> but we began our campaign with two very, very clear intentions. Number one, we were going to center communities of color, we were going to engage the marginalized and the disadvantaged, and we were going to build that in coalition with white voters, and we were going to make that work. But because I am Southern, I also knew we had to build a voter protection team unlike anything that had ever been seen in the state of Georgia because my opponent, although I didn't know he was going to be the person who got the nod, my opponent writ large was going to be a party that was determined to make sure everyone I needed couldn't be heard. We did everything we intended to do. And as a result, we tripled Latino turnout for Democrats in the state of Georgia. We tripled Asian Pacific Islander turnout in the state of Georgia. We increased youth participation rates by 139%. We increased black voting rates by 40%, which doesn't sound as exciting as tripling in 139. Until I tell you this. In 2014, 1.1 million Democrats voted for governor in that election, 2014, 1.1 million. In 2018, 1.2 million black people voted for me. We transformed the 
electorate. And I did something else I was told could not be done, that if I centered communities of color, if I said out loud the words gay rights, or even worse, abortion rights, or gun safety, that I was absolutely never going to get another white vote and I was going to push all of the white people left in the Democratic Party into the arms of the Republicans. But instead, I achieved the highest rate of white voters in Georgia since Bill Clinton. <laughs> Because I didn't talk about issues that were in opposition. I talked about issues that could bring us together because everyone wanted the same thing. We had the highest turnout of voters for Democrats in Georgia history. More than Barack Obama, more than Hillary Clinton. 1.9 million people showed up. But on the other side of the equation was the architect of voter suppression and a cartoon villain who decided that he could run his own election because he had been planning almost as long as I had. The Secretary of State of Georgia, Bill C Brian Kemp, had purged 1.4 million voters by election day. He had clo overseen the closure of 214 precincts, which according to independent analysis meant that 50 to 60,000 people literally could not get to the polls. He oversaw one of the highest rejection rates of absentee ballots, of provisional ballots. We have the longest wait times for African American voters in the country in Georgia. Places that didn't have power cords for the machines, though electricity is a new thing. Places where they didn't have a sufficient number of poll workers, where they ran out of ballots. And they knew it was going to happen because they designed it to happen. But what happened to me in Georgia, while singular and obscene, is not unusual. Because across this country, voter suppression has been hard at work. But we have a chance to reverse their gains. We have a chance to understand that voter suppression has three pieces to it. Can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you get access to a ballot and does your ballot get counted? Registration and staying on the rolls is critical because across this country, they know that the point of entry for democracy is getting your name on that list. And so in states like Florida, they've made it a crime if you try to register a voter and don't get it perfectly right. They've tried to do the same thing in Tennessee. They've done it in Wisconsin. In Georgia, they've tried, but we've been able to stop it a little bit. Can you stay on the rolls? Voter purges exist because they do not want you to be heard. In the state of Georgia, just in December, they purged 309,000 people. That's how many people were listed for purging. We had groups like you around the country calling through 100,000 people we knew weren't dead, and we <laughs> thought were still in Georgia, because typically you should only be purged because you're dead or because you're gone. Well, we called through that 100,000 person list, and we got 4,500 people back on the roll simply because they hadn't gotten the little postcard that looked like the Publishers Clearinghouse telling you, you won a million dollars. <throat> but then we did one step further. We filed a lawsuit to enjoin the purge. And on the day of the hearing, the morning of the hearing, the Secretary of State announced, oops, we made 22,000 errors, meaning they had illegally purged 22,000 people. I don't know of any other job where you can make 22,000 mistakes in a single day and keep your job. <laughs> But he wasn't alone because in Kentucky in 2019, Matt Bevin, the governor of Georgia, oversaw the purging of 170,000 people. But because of Fair Fight Action and Fair Fight 2020, we got 140,000 people back on the rolls, and Matt Bevin lost by 5,000. But across this country, there are states, 44 states, that use some version of use it or lose it, meaning if you do not vote, you do not have the right to vote. I know of no other constitutional right that you lose simply because you choose not to use it. I did not go hunting on Saturday, but no one has taken away my Second Amendment right. <laughs> Why can I lose my fundamental access to democracy simply because I choose not to make a choice? So that's the first piece. The second is, do you have access to the ballot? That means if they shut down your polling place and the only polling place left is on a hill, if you are physically disabled, you cannot vote. If you are 10 miles away and don't have a car, you cannot vote. 
If you can't get off work during the early voting period and the only chance you have is a two hour window that the federal law requires you to have even though you don't get paid for it, if you can't get to that polling place, you cannot vote. That is voter suppression. If you apply for an absentee ballot and it never shows up, that's voter suppression. If they shut down your early voting places, like they're doing in Florida, North Carolina, and Texas, that's voter suppression. You cannot access the ballot and you cannot vote. And if you manage to jump through those two hurdles, registering, staying on the rolls, and getting access to the ballot, the question is, does your ballot count? Otherwise known as Florida. <laughs> because in Florida, Georgia, Texas, Iowa, Michigan, Wisconsin, the impediments to actually getting your ballot counted are legion. Absentee ballots thrown out because your signature doesn't match. My signature doesn't match from Kroger to CVS. <laughs> I should not lose my right to a democracy because somebody watched forensic files the night before they volunteered at a polling place. And yet, throughout our country, that happens. Voter ID laws that say that you can show up, but because you did not get proof that you were born in a hospital, even though you voted for years, they can take it away. I'm not being hyperbolic. In the state of Wisconsin, because of their voter ID law, a woman who was born in Missouri in the 1920s, who had voted in elections for decades, had to update her ID. But this time in Wisconsin, even though she had a Wisconsin driver's license, they told her she had to prove her, she had to get her birth certificate. She could only get a certificate of live birth because she was born in segregated Missouri and not allowed to be born in a hospital. And so there could not be a hospital birth certificate for her. There would not be for anyone who had been born when she was, who was born black in Missouri. And even though Wisconsin got a copy of her existing driver's license, the 1930s census about her, they still told her she could not vote and she missed an election for the first time